Steve, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for inviting me to speak this morning. Since we're here in Washington, we're not in Austin or Boston, we're not in San Francisco or San Jose, the political uh, dimension of this struck me as, as important. You know, politics, uh, obviously, it's a dirty word. We, oh, that's just politics, he's just playing politics. But politics is the uh, group decision-making process. Four guys, they want to have lunch. Deciding where they're going to have lunch involves politics. There may not be any kind of rule that's obvious or spoken or acknowledged, but the negotiation of, well, how about this? How about vegetarian? Or, you know, well, do they have a liquor? Can I get a beer? Those little considerations in the decision, that's politics. What we have in our political life now is often a disagreement about the results of what we see as the politics at the national level and at, at, at all levels. But often that disagreement really is very much about the process. How did we, how did we get there? Um, think, of, think of the situation where you have university tuition uh, to be raised. Uh, well, who decided to raise it? Who decided how much it's to be raised? Whose voices exactly were heard in that process? And many people, many students in particular, say, wait a minute, my voice was not heard, our voices were not heard, and therefore the process is legitimate, and it is a crisis of legitimacy of the decision-making process that penetrates so much of what we see as politics today. Are we going to allow, uh, at the national level, will, will uh, the libertarian nominee Gary Johnson be on the ballot in Pennsylvania? Because the major parties are conspiring to keep him off the ballot because they're afraid he'll take votes away from one side or another and throw the election in a way that they don't want. Often the explanation of a decision, of a political decision, covers up or disguises uh, the process. That we, uh, we have a, a great sort of rational announcement of sort of what the conclusion is, leaving out how we got there. And that further undermines our sense of the legitimacy in the decision making if we don't like the outcome. I think it's important to recognize that we're not talking about simply counting votes. You know, it's not four guys want to go lunch and we sort of put a motion on the table, uh, all in favor of Subway, you know, all in favor of the steak and ale, and sort of decide on that basis. It's very often we negotiate things that are very important to us, as well as things that aren't so important. Now, as you think about the groups that you belong to, and the decisions that you have an interest in, it's that it's that having an interest in the outcome of the decision that drives people into politics. You know, I, what, you know, do I care? Do I want this outcome or not? And so we find here in Washington people coming who are concerned about things that they have great deals of passion about. And so to the extent you're interested in politics or not, it reflects what your passions are. If you're interested in the outcome of decisions about how uh, rules for writing a particular software take place, you have, a pa you have an interest in that, you have an interest in the outcome, you get involved in figuring out how those decisions are made. And the key thing is that you are then asserting your interest. You assert your interest, obviously, you make an argument. Obviously, you begin to enlist allies. Maybe you build a coalition. And then you face the choice. Is, am I satisfied with simply trying to influence the outcome, influence the decision, or do I want to take a role in the governance of this decision-making process? Do I want to maybe take it over? Do I, am I dissatisfied? And this, you know, we find this thing going on, you know, student government, boards of education, the Congress, all of this about, uh, am I satisfied with the way the decisions are being made? Do I simply want to influence it, or do I want to take it over? And it is that kind of choice that sort of depends, that begins to lead you into the depth of your political engagement in whatever little sphere or big sphere you're involved in. 
let me ask a, uh, sort of a question that sort of helps bring this home in, 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 in another way. Uh, a show of hands, how many of you got a speeding ticket in the last three years? Raise your hand if any of you got a speeding ticket in the last three years. I right, had a small sampling of people. Of those of you who got a speeding ticket, how many of them were local, you know, I was going 45 in a 25 mile zone, or it was a school zone or something like that? Raise your hand if it was a kind of local ticket. Almost nobody. Uh, one in the back. And there, the question of what that speed limit is, is set at the local level. If I ask, you know, I was expecting there might have been a few more speeding tickets, but that's, um, you know, if you, what I, the point that I want to make is at the local level, decisions that impact you are made. Is, is, this, is this 25 mile an hour speed limit on this stretch of four lane highway, make, does it make sense? Is, or is it a speed trap? Or is it a political payoff to a noisy neighbor who simply does, is tired of speeding cars? You know, maybe is this a, a, a relic of, of you know, the fact that there were children who lived in this neighborhood 10 years ago and they haven't changed the speed limit? How many of you know who your local elected representative is to your county or city government? represents your district. How many of you know who they are? Excellent. A lot of people know. How many of you have spoken in person to that representative? Excellent. How many of you have written to that representative about, you know, or emailed them about one? Good. That kind of engagement in the decision-making process is critical. It's critical if you have an interest. And let me ask a, a, a more tricky question. How many of you were satisfied with the outcome of the decision you were trying to influence in local government? A hand, another hand. How many of you thought that the wrong decision was made in local government and you were upset? Some hands as well. How many of you thought that money played the, the, was the deciding factor? That is money meaning contributions, money from interested parties was the deciding factor. A few hands. There's no question that money plays a factor in every kind of decision in which the value of something is involved. If it's the value of land, and is the value of land going to be affected by how land is developed, how it's zoned, uh, critically important. Is value of land affected by, are there schools, are there shopping centers, um, are the roads adequate, are the interchanges sufficient, is there the water supply, is there sewage run, and sewage lines, or all of these kinds of things are issues at the local level and they affect, if you are a landowner, the value of your land and, and so people get engaged in that. Now if you're a big landowner, you have the resources. But big landowners are usually outnumbered by the small landowners. And the small landowners therefore have more votes. And in some sense, the fundamental tension in the politics is between the influence of the people with the money and the access and the influence of all of the voters. And if the voters do not mobilize, then clearly the people with the access win. And so the challenge for those of us who believe in sort of democracy, who believe in sort of the advocacy for the little guy, is to figure out what are the tools that we can use to help empower and mobilize the little guys. And very often this is access to information. That the big guys, uh, they, have, uh, they have the ability to commission studies, they can prepare reports, they can uh, do analysis of what they think the relevant economic factors are. The challenge for ordinary citizens who are not technical experts, they're not statisticians, is to figure out how can I easily get my hands on information to answer questions such as who's involved, how much money are they contributing, what is the land worth, what are, what are the, who's, uh, who's going to benefit. 
and figuring out sort of how to design applications that ordinary citizens can use to dig into the decision-making process of the government is, I think, the cutting edge of where democracy is going to go in our society. And that, I'm happy to say, is in your hands. It's in your hands to figure out how those tools can be developed. Certainly not in mine, because I don't have the, I don't have the skills. At this, we have a similar kind of situation on a larger scale at the state level. Are any of you from states in the United States that have a medical marijuana law? Raise your hand. Well, that's, of course, a matter that was decided in either your state legislature or by the voters of your state under your state's constitution. We don't have a situation where local governments have the power to create medical marijuana laws. The way the constitutional balance of power is, health care is a matter that the states get to control. States get to control the question of marriage laws. Who qualifies for marriage? How many of you are from states that allow same-sex marriage? Critical kind of state question. And, and so the question then would be, how many of you know the name of your state representative in your state, rep state House of Representatives, state delegate? Raise your hand. Good, a large number. How many of you know a name of a state senator that represents you? And how many of you have communicated with those representatives or that senator? about a matter that concerns you. Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. This is something you, so you should be proud of this. Because this is really the essence of how the political system works. Having worked for members of Congress for nine years, they are keenly interested, keenly interested in what their voters and what their constituents think. And if their constituents say nothing, then it's the folks with the money and the access, who make the contributions, who have the deciding factor. I think that the big, the big factor that enables large corporations to have as much political power in our system is a kind of self-defeating sophistication. Show of hands, how many of you think of yourselves as politically sophisticated? Raise your hand. You sort of know, you know what the system is and how it works. And you, you figured out that it's sort of, how many of you think it's sort of gamed for the rich? The rich run it. The rich control it. It's all an inside fixed game. I would suggest that that sort of sophisticated view, that cynical view, is the real secret sauce of the rich and powerful. That is, they've already won the psychological part of the game. That... The citizen, yeah, you know, why, 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 waste my, why get my hands dirty in politics? You know, why get in there with all those sleazy lobbyists and all those, you know, interest groups? And yet, when citizens do speak out, it is, it is the members of Congress and the elected representatives who actually are keenly aware because they want first to be re-elected. The power, it's not so much the power to vote, it's the power to defeat. The citizen power to defeat in re-election, that's the, what scares the crap out of an elected official. And it is that power that, that citizens have when they mobilize. And they can do it when they're paying attention. And so I bring back my challenge to you which is to think about what are the kinds of tools for looking at political behavior, looking at the actions of government agencies that can be used to demand accountability and to mobilize the passions of people. Now, there's a great deal of indirection in politics. There's a sort of, um, watch what the hand over here is doing because the hand over here has got its hands on the lever. There's a lot of that. And it is a tool that we need to be very conscious of. I worked on gun control. In March 1981, John Hinckley, you know, shot President Reagan at the Washington Hilton Hotel, and I was the, the counsel for the gun control issue for the House Judiciary Committee. And it set off, of course, a wave of, you know, should we pass new gun control laws? Uh, and what I found in gun control was 
Members did not want to touch it at all if they could possibly avoid it. We had a bill that uh, a congressman from New York introduced to ban Teflon-coated bullets that, were, that he decided to call cop killer bullets. Now, the, what, what determines the ability of a projectile to penetrate an object is primarily its velocity, not whether it's covered in Teflon. And the velocity of a firearm, of, of a projectile, is determined primarily by the barrel length of the firearm. So that if you're firing a rifle, even a very small, soft projectile at a, at a police officer wearing bullet-resistant armor, that bullet-resistant armor is really designed to defend against a handgun with a short little barrel. And so this concept of cop-killer bullet, you quickly realize, is utterly bogus as a, as a term. What you really want to do is, can you control and regulate projectile handgun pairs that might be powerful enough to defeat the soft body, soft body armor that is worn by dignitaries and police officers. And that requires then doing actual sort of bench tests. You have a standardized weapon and you sort of fire your projectile at a target and you measure how much penetration there is and you sort of use science. The National Rifle Association you know, jumped up and down, banning bullets. Why? The next step is, well, ban guns. We can't ban bullets. And this, this kind of actual science then got defeated. They, they came up with some ideas. Well, you know what? We're losing the politics on this. Let's, let's list objects that we'll ban that aren't actually made into bullets, like depleted uranium. And so the spokesman for the NRA you know, got together a bunch of the NRA supporters and introduced a bill to ban cop killer bullets made out of depleted uranium and other kinds of materials. And it passed overwhelmingly. And the NRA then s sort of dodged a bullet, so to speak, in a particular political battle they didn't want to continue to fight. So you have distraction from what are real issues. And you find this throughout the, 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 legal, the, the, the legal arena. The policy making is also highly personal. Um, I assume most of you have heard of the drug ecstasy. How, show your hands. How many of you have heard of ecstasy, MDMA? Yeah, nearly everybody uh, in your generation has heard of it. Um, I wrote the law in 1984 that the DEA used to ban ecstasy. What had happened was um, people were uh, experimenting with ways to make uh, very different kinds of opiates. And there's a synthesis for making a, a, an opiate called meperidine, which if you're not careful, has a contaminant known as m triple -P, which has the side effect of producing rapid onset of Parkinson's disorder. And so there was an epidemic of this in the particular areas where the meperidine synthesis was being botched. And um, somebody came up at DE, DEA, has a, a PR department, they came up with the term designer drugs, those fiendish dope chemists trying to get one step ahead of us and put on the market drugs that have not been banned. And so DEA looked at this and said, we need emergency scheduling. There's a process. There's a whole seven-step legal fact-finding, rule-making process DEA has to follow to ban a drug. But they wanted special sort of short-circuit, rapid-fire power to do this when they identified a problem. And so Congress said, Seems reasonable enough. You have these people getting Parkinson's disorder, you know, from botched drugs and so on. Maybe this is a good idea. Not looking too closely at sort of what the economics and all of this and, and the consequences of illegality and so on. Well, the first drug that DEA chose to ban was not some newly discovered drug. There were, peop there were bars in Texas that were selling MDMA over the counter. And there were 
DEA had started a process, it filed a notice saying we'd like to classify this compound as a Schedule I compound, it's going to be banned for all use. But there were psychiatrists in the country who were using MDMA in their psychotherapy. It wasn't an approved medication, but they were getting pharmaceutical grade from certain uh, private chemists, and they were finding very good results. And so they followed the, the legal procedure and filed a petition saying, no, MDMA should be Schedule III, should be a controlled drug like other drugs. And there was now a hearing and fact-finding process all going on according to law. But within the DEA's political apparatus and enforcement apparatus said, you know what, we've got this new power, let's just use it, let's ban this thing called ecstasy. So it makes the cover of Time magazine, ecstasy. And suddenly, this obscure chemical MDMA that was known around Dallas and in psychiatrist's office suddenly becomes front page story and every ecstasy, hmm? Where can I get some of that shit? You know, <laughs> ecstasy, huh? And of course, DEA built an epidemic around ecstasy in the way in which they promoted it in, in this illegality. Well, it happened that they also, in their haste, legally botched the regulation of it. A psychiatrist went to court and successfully had the ruling struck down by DEA because they failed to follow the procedures that they asked Congress to give them. They ended up by 1986 getting it banned um, through that emergency power. But then they said, you know what, we need a bigger, more powerful law. We need to ban these kinds of drugs, even undiscovered drugs, out into the future. We want to ban chemicals that have never been discovered. And so the, you have a kind of a fundamental due process question. How do you ban something that hasn't yet been discovered? Well, you need to define it very carefully. And so that became our challenge. What we're trying to do then was, um, so one principle would be, is if you've got categories of chemicals that are currently banned, you could say anybody who makes something that's substantially the same chemically and has substantially the same kind of stimulant, depressant, or hallucinogenic effect as such a chemical, well, that sounds like a designer drug. Let's at least define it that way. We'll ban chemicals that both get you high and look like existing banned chemicals. That's not too unreasonable. And then Congressman Dan Lundgren from California got involved. He was on the Judiciary Committee then. He said, wait a minute, you mean you have to have a two-step process? What about those chemists who are just going to sort of make something completely new that's not chemically the same, but will get you high? We ought to ban that. So we had a chemist on the committee, Bruce Morrison from, from New Haven, I said, wait a minute, you know, you know we, let's do this narrowly. Chemists, you know, know what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. And so we ended up with two members of Congress trying to fight about this definition. Are we going to have one or the other, substantial similarity to the chemical, and or substantial effect of getting you high? How do you think the outcome was? It was or. Lundgren won, the lower standard. That's what got enacted in the designer drug law in 1986. So here you have a case. Now, was the public involved in that? The public was not involved. This was an all inside the Congress, very hasty kind of job going on. I think today it would be much harder for that kind of law to pass because today we have such rapid communication technology that we didn't have then. And we have so many more people able to be on top of what's going on on the Capitol almost on an hour by hour basis. And so I think we're in certain respects because of the work of people like you in developing these communications tools, these analytical tools, our political system is stronger than it was 25 years ago. So political power. We've talked about the power of money. We've talked about the general power of the sort of civics 101 citizenry. What about guns? You know, Mao Zedong said that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. A show of hands, how many of you agree that Mao Zedong is right? Political power grows out of the ba barrel of a gun. I see a couple, you know, a few hands, handful of hands. 
And that certainly may have been true in the 1930s and 40s in, in China, where you could build an army. But today, in the United States, even though, even though half of American households have a firearm, so, you know, something like 100 million Americans own guns, you can't form a military unit and sort of train. You don't have access to larger weapons or to, to tanks, or armored personnel carriers, or chemical weapons. You don't have the ability to really resist the government. Government is not going to come knocking on your door, seizing the guns of individual citizens. But the ability, I think, of our, of our people to stage a violent reaction to government power um, is pretty much inconceivable. That political power in our society, I don't think any longer, can be said to grow out of the barrel of a gun. Um, So, power out of barrel gun, power of money. Here's the key. And the key is essentially the power of knowledge. The power of knowledge. Knowledge is power. And it, you folks have the access to giving that power to the public. The key tool for mobilizing politics is passion and knowledge and passion go together. And you have the ability to sort of drive the knowledge piece. We know that there are facts and there are pseudo-facts. Pseudo-fact, rape prevents pregnancy. Pseudo-fact, you know, Obama was not born in Hawaii. You know, we, you know, there are all kinds of facts throughout the government. And I think that sort of, I want to close with sort of saying that the challenge you have is to, f is to, is to work with political actors to identify what are the kinds of of areas of hidden facts that can expose where the government is not working properly. Because if knowledge is power, ultimately there's a way in which the government leadership only has the illusion of power. Because in so many cases, they don't actually know what the government's doing. If you want to know, for example, what the Department of Justice is doing, you can go and look at the data for fiscal year 2011. Well, in this month, at the end of this month, fiscal year 2013 starts. Imagine starting your junior year in college and finally getting your final freshman year grades. You'd say that's absurd. It's that level of knowledge that many members of Congress have about the government that they think they're controlling. And I think that people like you can help bring real-time access to the knowledge that's already lurking around in government databases. So that's my challenge to you, and I thank you very much. I hope that you have this uh, an exciting time in Washington as I've had for the last 33 years. I'm happy to take any questions in the remaining time. Thank you. Do you take the liberty of the first question? Thank you very much, Eric. Yes, um, we've seen with the case of SOPA and CISPA that ill-advised legislation has at least temporarily, uh, by concerted action on the internet, been, been staved off. Uh, I wonder if you think this represents a trend and what the likely response of the political machine might be to this level of activism from technologists. That's, a, that's an excellent question, and, it, and it, it, I think that it's very much a trend. To the extent that we can hook up the passion that people have for um, open access to the, the, uh, the tools of communication, the tools of information, the sense that I'm not being censored, the information I want is not being censored, and that that, that, that can be multiplied into hosts of other kinds of passion, I think that that kind of political mobilization uh, is going to be increasingly popular. These will become different kinds of channels uh, following the traditional norm of mobilizing large numbers of people. Hey. Um, the point you made at the end, that the, the issue is of, often just uh, knowing what's going on in the process. There are, there are many discussions, many decisions being made every day, and quite often it's just an issue of, I, I have a real big interest in problem X, but I didn't know people were making a discussion, having a discussion about problem X in Parliament, and I'd only found out about it after the fact when the law got passed and all of a sudden my interests have, haven't been represented. Um, getting the knowledge out is obviously a key part of that, but part of the way that to, in order to make that happen, there needs to be a community 
uh, interaction between the people who are actively involved in the process, who aren't technologically skilled or aren't te te technologically uh, focused, and the people like the people in this room who are technologically focused but don't know how to get involved in the process. Now, this isn't an unusual thing in that there are areas of domain knowledge that never speak to each other because we don't go to the same parties. Um, do you have any, any ideas or, or if, if from your experience of, of being involved in that process of how, how do we get these two groups to talk together to, to actually hit a goal, to, to, to achieve the things we need to achieve? My experience has been that the more sophisticated political groups understand that they need to reach their audiences rapidly, and this means that they need to take into their own house the technical skills to make that kind of communication. It's a, it's, a, it's a challenge of the enormous amount of information we have coming in. But you know, for, you know, I'm thinking of an example. Just recently there was a, um, if I recall correctly, there was a primary election in the state of Vermont. Vermont has been a state that's been debating sort of how to expand its medical marijuana law to provide dispensaries. A group that I helped start in the, in the early 90s, the Marijuana Policy Project, has people on the ground in Vermont identifying who are the uh, state representatives who have been obstacles for this and putting out the word to say, these are the people we want to defeat in the primary election. And so seeing those kinds of emails go out. So, you know, email, Facebook, Twitter, all of these are tools that are being used so that a, pol a sophisticated political organization is desperate to acquire you know, you know, the, the, the tool that you're going to use to get information, whether it's your cell phone number, your forgetting texts, your Twitter feed, whatever it is that you're going to be paying attention to, that's what you want your political gurus to have access to. And so they spend, the, the ones that have the money, will spend the money to figure out what's a strategy to get you to communicate. How many of you get a direct mail uh, in which enclosed is a petition that's going to go to your senator or congressman? That you're supposed to send this petition back to uh, the national office. How many of you get those kinds of petitions in the mail? A few of you. What is important to the sender of that petition is not that, you're, that they're going to deliver a petition to somebody who may very well be an ally. What they are trying to keep is a current email address, a current phone number, a current address to solicit you for fundraising. That, these, you know, that sending a political message is sometimes the cover for gathering data about you to support the organization's political activity and fundraising activity. Does that answer your question? Possibly, yeah, I guess. Okay. Good morning. Um, so recently, uh, somebody 3D printed a firearm. And uh, so recently, somebody 3D printed a firearm. They developed plans yes. to print a firearm by themselves at home and we're starting to hit the point where information itself becomes the ability to undermine power. We saw what WikiLeaks did to power. How do we as a community of people who want the raw materials and the freedom to tinker and explore with information promote the restraint of power as opposed to the directed use of power? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the, the, the question at the end of that. So. Um, I'm anticipating very shortly that there will sudden, su suddenly be regulations about the ability to fabricate new things because 3D printing is getting to the point where we can make firearms, we can make chemicals, we can make anything we want out of raw materials and $1,000 to make a printer. Um, in the general trend of things has been that um, the more that even if there is a substantial legitimate use for an idea or a technology, if there is a use that is fear causing undermining of power and dangerous that the in, impulse is to ban the technology for everybody. Okay, so I, I think I get the point now. Um, in terms of your example of sort of the 3D production of a firearm, um, that already would be simply, from my analysis, would be a looked at as are you manufacturing a firearm and if so, is that legal? And whether you make it from forging the steel and fabricating it on your workbench, 
or making it in a 3D process, it's the same. And that is, you're permitted to do that until you go into the business of manufacturing firearms, in which case you need to have a license from the federal agency that regulates that when you're in the business. And so, to some extent, you may find, the, you may, you may find a government agent sort of saying, wow, here's a, we've heard about this guy making firearms 3D. Should we see if we can entrap him by, convince, by trying to get him to sell us one of these things? So, is he in the business or not? This, is, this has always been one of the raps against the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, that you can sell firearms out of your own collection without a license, but you can't be in the business of selling firearms. So, is this my collection or is this my inventory? And so, sometimes that becomes the question of what this, the special agent who's done the investigation will tell the court. The, here are all the trappings of an inventory versus a collection. Is a collection carefully labeled and everything is sort of well organized and neat, or is it all jumbled up in a drawer? Well, a serious collector is going to very carefully take care of these very precious firearms. Guy who's running an illegal gun selling business out of the trunk of his car may treat them like crap. Well, you can't necessarily tell just by how the, 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 the suspect you know, is handling the goods. And so these become real dangers in, am I a target of the government's interest? And the way in, you know, these become problems that we have throughout the society with a whole host of laws. Have I piqued the interest of a government agent because I'm perceived to be maybe a terrorist, maybe dangerous? And these are the problems of the abuse of law by individuals in government employee, by, by government employee. I, I, I'm sorry, I was probably rambling and not making a whole lot of sense. Um, I guess my question is, so uh, I, I heard a lot of what you were saying as how do we direct government power toward the ends that we want for our community? Um, what I want is to be left alone. So how do we as a community direct government power to restrain itself? That, you know, in the words of Thomas Jefferson, requires eternal vigilance. You know, that, you know, you, you, you force the restraint by mobilizing with other people who wish to be left alone to say these particular regulations, these particular policies infringe on our understanding of what it means to have liberty in our society. Too often in the discourse of lawmaking, the word liberty is often left out. You'd, I found as counsel to the Judiciary Committee, almost never was there a preliminary st step of saying, do we have power under the Constitution to do this? Is this really authorized? Or is this simply necessary and proper? Do we sort of jump to the conclusion of presumption that this is okay? Uh, we had a bill, um, remember a, a staffer called me up and wanted to pass some kind of law dealing with child abuse. And I asked the staffer, I said, um, I forget who they, they worked for, well, you know, where, where in the Constitution is this power provided to Congress? And the staffer kind of, what are you talking about? They, they, they didn't even understand the question. And there is that problem, that there are many people in government who sort of don't begin with liberty as the default position. And that regulation has to be justified very carefully in terms of how does it balance against our liberty interests. And that is, that is, the cha that is, that is for all of us a, a key part of the challenge. So that we can, if we can say, oh, there's a problem I want to have fixed, global warming. Um, carbon contributes to that. Hey, how about banning fireplaces? How about banning fires in the hearth? Now, certainly if you think of 18th century framers of the Constitution, none of them could have conceived that Congress would have had the power to ban a fire in the hearth in the living room. Is that something that in 21st century we would say no longer necessary? 
the amounts of the pollutants that come out of all of these collective hundreds of thousands of fireplaces in the county or in the town or across the region become serious health pollution, you know, air pollution problems, health problems. Well, gee, do I have the liberty to sit in front of my fire and toast my fingers and toast marshmallows and so on? These kinds of, these kinds of questions then go to a deeper question, which is, does the Constitution that we have, written down in you know, 1787 in Philadelphia, ratified in 1788, with all of its antiquated rules and limitations, is that still a document that makes sense in 2012, in 2013? And I think that it might be time to have a constitutional convention to think about a new constitution. You know, it's, ama it's amazing. It's over 200 years old. It's going to be 250 years old in a few years. Maybe it's time to ask all of these questions in a more fundamental way to reaffirm that the right to be left alone is a fundamental American right. And how we think about where that right gets impinged, gets put down on paper again for future generations. I think it's a great question. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I, for one, uh, think it's fantastic that a technology conference is starting off with a bit of politics. I guess Twitter disagrees. Um, I get hopefully quite a quick question about your approach. Um, you said towards the start of your, your piece something about uh, the need for a, a systemic shift or a, a paradigmatic change, a, a kind of a, a, real, uh, a real sort of sea change in, in the way we approach political involvement and, and the way that we, we try and change the world. Um, but by, by, the end of, uh, by the end of what you were saying, it, it, it seemed that you were suggesting that you, you can fix all of the world's problems, uh, sort of ra racism, sexism, you talked about environmental destruction a few seconds ago, uh, exploitation of workers, uh, simply through better interfaces to government data sources. And I wonder how your, your idea that there needs to be a more fundamental change comes into that. Um, Einstein famously said, and I'm hopelessly paraphrasing here, you can't solve a problem in the same state of mind uh, as you caused the problem. And where, where in your view, does that, uh, does that sort of, that mental shift take place mm -hmm. when, when mm -hmm. you're talking about building on existing structures, using existing forms of, uh, uh, representation and communication. Uh, and then finally, uh, I just wanted to uh, make a quick observation uh, on your point that you couldn't pass such a bad law today uh, with reference to, to the banning of MDMA. Um, NDAA went through a few months ago, and that was by all accounts a terrible law, and you've had the Patriot Act, you've had even more restrictive uh, drugs laws going through the, the medical marijuana laws are a, a, an exception to that, and as you said, on the state level rather than federal. So I, I, was, yeah, I was just wondering whether you had anything else to back up your, your assertion that um, communication has made our democracy better, because I, I'm not so sure. I think you might be right. I, you know, I, part of my job as a keynote speaker is to be optimistic and uplifting. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, I, I certainly didn't want to sort of start the conference off on a down note about the political future. You know, you may, you know, there, in my experience, just in the nine years I worked there, there was a tremendous shift in the way in which the Congress itself worked. When I started working, the subcommittee that I worked for paid attention to every single word and clause. We met in a, in a process of trying to rewrite federal law several hundred times before we actually reported out a bill in which everything had been sort of, you know, subject to debates and, and consideration and staff briefing memos. That was 1980 when we reported a, a comprehensive bill after that process. In 1986, after Len Bias died from a cocaine overdose, I was involved in the drafting of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act. And that bill was put together in four weeks in the middle of July to the middle of August. And the ability, one downside of technology, as far as the work of Congress goes, is that they now can put together enormous bills that have the, the 
appearance of coherence, the illusion, you know, every section is in the proper order, you know, section 101, section, followed by section 102 and so on, all because this stuff has sort of been put in, and you can generate, you know, a stack of a thousand pages that purports to be a bill. And we did this, and people do not know what's in the bill. No one knows what's in the entirety of the bill. And I found, you know, you know, people used to say, well, so Eric, you had this great job on Capitol Hill, you know, you were counsel of the Judiciary Committee, why'd you give it up? And my shorthand answer was, my bullshit meter broke. <laughs> you, know, that, you know, I go up to the Hill now and it's, you, know, you sit in the hearing room, it's like you're sitting under a Niagara of bullshit. You know, you know, and these, you know, the problem that you identify, I think, is real. But if we, if we sort of look at what are the options for political change, I think that the realm is relatively narrow. They remain mobilizing a passionate public, giving them the knowledge and the tools of what they can do. And that may be, you know, that may harken back to, you know, uh, you know, the House of Burgesses in Williamsburg in the 17th century and so forth. But I don't see, I don't see an alternative to, you know, there, it is conceivable. We could, in a new constitution, have direct democracy. We could, you know, that's, but, you know, half of all the voters are below average in intelligence. Do you want half, you know, do you want, you know, do you want, to put everything up to direct vote. I'm not sure I want to. I don't sure I trust the public in that kind of entirety. You know, these are some of my thoughts, and I'm not sure that I have a, a satisfactory answer to what you know, I appreciate is an extremely thoughtful and provocative question. No, that's great, thank you. And I will. Thank you very much. Thank you for your excellent questions.